uh, are very important to us, and so we appreciate that you're with us, so thank you for that. I'm going to ask, um, this is my only negative thing, if there's a player, if there's players that are sitting in the way back, or if you see them standing, we'd really like the players to be kind of sitting up close, and if you happen to be a parent that's sitting up close, that might be willing to give up your seat, if you see a player standing, we'd appreciate that, so just keep that in mind, and thank you for that. I see a couple players back there. Players, come on up. We want you up closer. One of the values that the uh, one of the values that Annika and our foundation and the AJJ have is gratitude and expressing thanks and being grateful for what you have. And uh, for me, just getting to know Annika over the past year, I mean, she's incredibly accomplished, obviously, for what she's done inside the ropes and now giving back. But she's one of the most grateful people I think I've ever met. And she's very appreciative of opportunities, very appreciative of you coming to this tournament to support it. Uh, appreciative that you would come here and you know listen to her. So um, it's just something, uh, we try to share life lessons. We sprinkle in life lessons and that's one I just would like you to remember as you continue your journey. And sometimes as you continue to rise up with your golf career or in the corporate world, sometimes you don't become as appreciative and grateful for things. And it's just something that I've learned from Annika that we just want to make sure that you continue to be grateful and thankful for your opportunities. And with that, of course, I need to thank Hilton Gratifications for sponsoring this event, and Rolex, and Eagle Creek for hosting us, and all the other partners here that have been supporting us this week. We're very grateful to them. I also would like to acknowledge the CEO of uh, the American Junior Golf Association, which many of you know, Stephen Hamlin over here. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for coming here. He <laughs> is the, you know, the, the best golf organization in the world, I think, running all these junior events for boys and girls. Uh, Katie Jones, you're here somewhere. Thank you for your work. And, And the whole team, the whole team is not getting any sleep this week to put on this event, so thank you very much. I don't get a chance to really rock it up. Oh, yes, give him a hand. <laughs> a few more people to thank, so just bear with me. I don't really get a chance to thank our team, uh, the colleagues and teammates at the Annika Foundation are amazing. Of course, Annika, her husband, Mike, uh, Taylor Gretton, who's worked her tail off this week, getting ready with Katie and her team and Morgan, who's not sleeping at all this week, doing all our communications and social media. They're amazing people. It's a small and mighty team. You would not believe all the things we do during the year. And so I just wanted to thank them for all their hard work. <laughs> Lastly, before I introduce Annika and our special guest, Catherine Muzi, um, I wanted to thank the players. Thank you for coming. Thank you for taking time out of your week to play in this event. Uh, it means a lot that you want to support us and be with us, so I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you parents for also coming with your daughters to play. Um, but I also, yesterday, just to back up during the nicer weather that we had, uh, I wanted to thank the players that played in the practice round. I appreciated that you kept a nice pace of play going throughout to allow us to get in our sold out junior round and we got off on time and were able to finish. So I wanted to thank the players that played in the practice round, but I also wanted to thank the players that played in the junior round. Um, I don't know if you wanted to, or if I asked you to, or what, but I really appreciated you spending time with the people that support the AJGA and people that support the Annika Foundation. And I cannot tell you how many emails I got for people that played in yesterday's junior round and it said that how impressed they were, not just as you as golfers, but just as you as people, and just that you interacted, and you were um, you know, so friendly, and made them feel welcome. So I wanted to express my thanks to you all that played in the gym jam, and give yourselves a round of applause, please. Um, I'm going to introduce Annika, say a few words, uh, and introduce Catherine, but one thing also, this is meant to be a Q&A session now, not for me. That's to ask Annika and Catherine any questions that are on your mind, because um, I don't want Annika trying to do trick shots inside here, so think of questions, 
And if you're, it's always tricky because you never want to be the first uh, young lady to ask a question. You know? You've got to get it started because uh, we really want to hear from you because they only want to talk about what you want to hear. So think about your questions. Annika, like what can you say? You all know she's considered the greatest of all time. She will never talk about herself, so now we get a chance to actually say a few things. Um, why is she considered the greatest of all time? Well, she's won over 90 professional events in her career. And there's so many, they actually kind of started to lose count because she won a lot in Europe. 90 plus times professional wins, amazing. 72 of them were LPGA Tour wins. She won 11, or 10 majors on the LPGA Tour, which is amazing. But she won an 11th major, and it was 13 years after she retired from full-time competitive golf, she came back to play in the U.S. Senior Women's Open 13 years later from competing, and won by eight shots. So that's now 11 majors for Annika. She's the only woman that has shot under 60 in a competitive tournament round. She shot 59. She buried 12 of the first 13 holes that round. Okay, think about that. You might want to ask her about that one. She played it in a PJ Tour event back in 2003. She was the first woman to do that in 58 years. That's a pretty big deal. Um, but the one stat that our crack team had found was, you know, if you win one golf tournament a year, it's considered a pretty good year in pro. So on average, that's like one out of 25 events in. That's 4% winning percentage. You know there was a five-year span uh, in Annika's career. She won 48 times out of 126 tournaments, which is a winning percentage of over 38% that she did over a five-year period. And I'm just like, how is that even possible? How is that possible? So you can think about that too. Um, three things that I learned, I learned so many things from Monica over the past year, but and I'll do it quickly. I learned that she's constantly wanting to learn and improve. So she always wanted to win and do her best, but I think her overriding goal was she always wanted to win, or she always wanted to learn something each week. And I only say this because we're only after the first round, but there's probably some of you who are somewhat disappointed from, you know, your score or result today. Like, Annika wants you to do well, she wants you to do your best this week. But really, she wants you to learn something about yourself as a person and learn something about your golf game that can help you improve in the future. That's probably her bigger goal for you this week. So she wants you to have a little bit of a broader perspective in life and in golf versus like, this is life or death today. So keep that in mind, she was always trying to learn. Um, the second thing was, I call it be a goldfish. She had this innate ability, and I've got stories from her husband, Mike, she could have a bad shot, a bad round, a bad tournament, and somehow she's able to flush it out of her head. And the best, the best tip I have for you to play bad golf is to let things linger, or to have negative thoughts come into your head. And Annika had this ability to focus on her shot, go through her routine, do her best on that shot, accept the result, learn from it, and then move on before the time she had hit her next shot or next spot. I, I play golf. That's a really difficult thing to do. But if you all can think about that, you know, be a goldfish, it will help you play better golf. And she had this innate ability to let things go. As long as she had committed to that shot, she could accept the result. Or accept the result of that week. So keep that in mind, and parents, keep that in mind, please, too. And the last thing is, I just learned that she's... Um, you know, just to be grateful in life. So keep those things in mind. Um, I get the uh, luxury to introduce Catherine Muzi, who's here to join us as a special guest. Uh, I've got some of this, like, trying to memorize in my head. Catherine was an AJGA Rolex All-American. Uh, she went to USC for four years and did a fifth year at University of South Carolina last year. She just graduated last June. She's played in multiple NCAA championships. Um, she's actually one of the first four women to become a, one of our Annika Development Program Ambassadors. We're going to be supporting 12 women as they come out of college uh, over a three-year period, um, supporting them with housing and a place to play at this beautiful club in South Carolina. Financially, we're trying to help them out, getting some mentorship sessions from Annika. We're trying to help some young women out of college 
She was impressive not just as a player, but as a person. So she was one of the first four that were selected. Uh, she's got status right now on uh, Ladies European Tour. Uh, she played the Women's All Pro Tour right after college graduation, which is now being called the Annika Women's All Pro Tour, because we're trying to help that tour and help young women get up to the Epson Tour and LPGA Tour. But I think the cool thing was last fall, she Monday qualified into an LPGA Tour event after one of the um, Women's All Pro Tour events. She Monday qualified in, we were so excited for her. And then she went to Dallas to play, and then she made the cut. We were so excited for Catherine making the cut in her first professional event. She finished tied for seventh. Pretty amazing stuff. <laughs> but I think the thing that impressed us most was uh, Catherine reached out to us um, a couple months ago and just said, hey Rob, you all have done so much for me as a foundation. You've all done so much for women's golf. I, I want to help. I want to give back. How, like, how can I help? So we asked Catherine to be here on her own time. Or, you know, she's volunteering her time just to be here to meet you all, kind of spend this clinic session with Annika. So it's just an example of someone who's accomplished a lot in life but is now wanting to help give back. And I know there's some of you out there that have already done the same thing, Yana Wilson, not to mention others, that have given back their time to um, help at AGAG events or help to help at our clinics. And it's just really cool to see kind of the cycle go on that Annika has hopefully inspired you to play great golf, but hopefully she's inspired you to be great people and to give back and think about others. So, um, Catherine, we appreciate you being here. Give her a round of applause. Okay, with all that said, I'd love Annika and Catherine to come up here and um, take over the show, and I'll um, leave it up to you. Thank you. yesterday and um, we're supposed to have a short game clinic but I figured you have been putting and chipping enough today right and you probably don't want to sit and look at the two of us chip and putt so we thought why don't we just do a little inside session so thank you Rob for the introduction I really appreciate it and we're grateful for you um, I must say you know it took me a little while I've been called a few things in my life um, I was called a goat and I did not know what that was. I was like, a goat? It took me a little while to um, understand what that meant. But now I've been called a goldfish. So now I'm like, what's next? So maybe we're starting to zoom around here, Rob. Um, but uh, anyway, great to be here. And um, how was today? Okay, I saw some really good scores. Ooh, I'm going to the cup better than that. Um, yes, I really. Um, Good scores, I thought, as you know, I mean, not to emphasize something you already know, but when you play in these type of conditions, you know, sometimes you just gotta kind of lower the expectations, go out there, you know, one shot at a time, I thought it's even more important when it's this tough and you never know what kind of lies you will get, what kind of bounces or, you know, if the wind will take it or not. I'm sure the course played a little longer, um, but it's certainly a true test of patience on days like this. And um, a lot of times, days like this, I think, is what makes you stronger. You know, just because it's harder work, you, you know, more committed, and you're more focused, and I'm sure you're more tired today than probably around when it's 80 degrees and sunny. Um, but let me tell you, the, these are the days where you really improve a lot more, I think. Tough days or challenging days where it really test you um, from the very start to the finish, I think. Those are the days that make you stronger, um, and uh, these are the days where it can make a difference. You know, I always say a lot of people can play well in good weather, but not a lot of people can play well in, in bad weather. So, um, as tough as you might have felt, as tired as you might be now, and as cold and wet you are, but um, this is a good test. And um, I wish I could say this for the last time we played in rain, but no, it's going to rain tomorrow again. So. Um, 
hang, hang tight, be strong, just keep fighting. And, um, you know, sometimes don't necessarily have a score in mind. Just go out there and, and just kind of hit one shot at a time and see what happens. Uh, it's the same for everybody. When you stand there on the first tee, everybody's going to have the same conditions. So just tell them to use your mind, your patience as the 15th club. So just a little, a few words there. But, um, Catherine, we are super excited that you're here. Thank you very much yeah, for having Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's uh, wonderful, and uh, we're so proud to have you part of the team. And as you know, it's a little bit of a new journey with the Annika Development uh, Program, and you're certainly setting the pace. And I thought, I know um, Rob introduced you a little bit, but um, do you want to maybe just introduce yourself a little differently, or how do you want the girls to think about you? And then maybe we can open yeah, up some sure. questions. So, my name is Catherine Moosey. I play at AJGA. I would say maybe five, six years ago. I graduated in 2018. Um, I played at this, at the Annika, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. I'm standing in so okay. right here. Um, <laughs> let me just like catch my breath for a little bit. Go into your pre-shot routine. Yeah, pre-shot routine. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a couple years since I played junior golf myself. Um, I did four years at the University of Southern California, I got a business degree, and then transferred for a fifth year at South Carolina. Um, I'm super grateful for my time at USC, Southern Cal, and then just because I did that fifth year at South Carolina, I was able to get into the Annika Development Program. Um, they had this application thing that my head coach, Kaylin Anderson, showed me in, I think it was last year in January, and I just, anything with Annika's name on it, we all know how good she is as a golfer, as a person, how much she does for the game. I just felt like it was something so worth signing up for um, because I actually went to South Carolina. They had this for the first year. Um, I'm an inaugural ambassador. They had it where you had to be a, either a resident or have graduated from a school in North Carolina, South Carolina, or Georgia. So because I did that fifth year, I was able to get a chance to apply. Um, now it's open to the entire US. So it doesn't matter where you graduated from college, you can apply, but it's certainly been a great help um, being able to practice at Old Barnwell, which is in South Carolina. It's a brand new course, it just opened. Um, and being able to get some help from Annika. We had a Q&A session, uh, I would say maybe in November or yeah, so a few months ago. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I was just kind of mind blown, like Annika knows my name kind of thing. Um, to be able to ask Q&A questions with her and the three other ambassadors, um, it was just definitely something that I was like just so grateful for, um, yeah. I think that's great. And we're certainly glad that, you, that you're here and that you're part of it. And your finish in Portland was amazing. Um, you want to talk a little bit? I mean, that, I assume that was your best finish ever. Like, mm -hmm. ever, the way you played too, not just, you know, I know it was an LPJ event, but just yeah. about your game. Why, I mean, what do you credit that success and what really worked that week for you? Yeah, so I was playing in a couple um, WAPT tournaments. Um, now it's sponsored by Annika. Um, I kind of did, so what happened in the tournament, I played in an Annika tour, um, kind of like below the Epson tour to try to just see how I would do. Um, and then I happened to get fifth place going into that qualifier I signed up for in Dallas. And then I shot a 69, won the qualifier, I had um, a random caddy on the bag who happened to work at a nearby course, and that was the first time we ever worked together. And then I did a practice round, made the cut, and then kept moving up. I was like maybe 80th place after round one, and then moved up to like 45th. And then the next day I was like 30th. And then I guess after the first nine holes of the final day, I was in like third place. So. And then I kind of dropped a little bit, but ended up getting seventh. But I'm still like super grateful for that opportunity. Um, yeah, I couldn't be 
especially that was like my first LPGA tournament. Like I honestly haven't been like the kind of star that's like a big name in um, amateur golf. Um, but like I'm kind of like a late bloomer person, I would say. So it's it's kind of like everybody has their own story. Like even for me, I wouldn't say I was like the best, like number one um, AJJ player. Like I did get like All American, got an USC. But it wasn't like I was like a rosé come like right out of college. Um, so I would just say like everybody like you have your own path. Um, be grateful for all of the opportunities you get. Be grateful for your family, friends, um, and um, like for me, golf has kind of been something where it's like it used to define me as a person. Like if I had a good day or a bad day. Um, that was one thing that we talked about in Annika's Q&A session as part of the ambassador program was like Even if you do shoot well, it doesn't mean you're on the top of the world And if you shoot bad, like it doesn't mean like you're like at the, the bottom Like golf doesn't define who you are and just like for me realizing that it's like Okay, I had a bad day, throw it away. Like that doesn't mean I'm a bad person. Oh, I like, like slice the drive Like this doesn't mean my driver's bad. It's like Golf can be a very tough game, and just especially out here, like with the rain and the tough, the tough circumstances too. Like, yeah, definitely, golf has shaped me as a person, and I'm so proud to just say I'm a part of the Onica Development Program. So, uh, what um, who did you play with on the LPGA there? Did you have any? I mean, I'm sure you have some role models. Who were you paired with? Anybody fun that you were excited to play with? And and you, you, know, you beat most of them. Yeah, I played with Christina Kim in the practice round. Oh, did you? Well, she's yeah. entertaining. Yeah, she. Yeah. I was like, oh, you're really talkative. Um, I was, cause she, she's such a character. Um, she, I think she told me like, cause it was my first LPGA tournament ever, and she was just kind of like, just, just try your best, like. I see that you definitely hit it really far, and that's distance is not your problem. Like just, just enjoy it. Like even like veteran caddies were like, just enjoy this opportunity. Just really have fun and embrace it. Um, I think I played with Mel Reed. I would say Sue O, but I didn't get paired with like any of the notables, but. It was super funny at breakfast. Um, like Leona McGuire like looked at me and I was like, oh my gosh. Like, and then I ended up tying her. I was like, damn it, I could have like even beat her. Yeah. Did but, you look at her back then? Like, just gave her kind of the look. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, Lexi Thompson's in the parking lot. Like, <laughs> cool. Yeah. Like she kind of like changed my attitude. Like I could compete with these people, and definitely like the LPGA and how they play is not as much of a difference as this tournament like you guys are the best juniors in the world playing in monica's finest junior tournament so yeah just keep keep going at it so before we open up to some questions i'm curious you know here you got the you know 2023 behind you um what are some of the goals that you have for 24 something you want to share that either you're working on or that would you know that you would love to see happen this year other than another or two more lpj events yeah, other than um, like LPGA starts, I would say I'm very process oriented. I'm very data driven. I look at a lot of data analytics in my golf game. Um, I would say some goals I'm trying to reach would be to um, get a better putting average, I would say. Um, usually whenever I try to shoot my best, I have like targets that I'm trying to reach, like how many fairways I want to hit how many greens, how many, what's my up and down percentage I'm striving for. And then if my putting is like at 25, 26 per round, then that's going to be a five under, like, good round. Um, I think just hitting my targets and continuing to be in the moment and really enjoy myself. Like, like I play golf because I like it. I think it's fun. And just being able to do all of this and play golf as a pro, it's just like living the dream life, honestly. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you for sharing. Do we have any questions? Or any comments? We got one way back there. Yeah. Oh, we got a microphone coming.
what's your favorite pre-run meal? Do you want to start? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, what would you eat before a round? I'm very much about, like, I want to get my protein in, and then I want to get a healthy fat in. I'm not really about um, grains, but I think I would do a steak, um, and maybe, like, broccolini or mashed potatoes. I think that would be my go-to. I would say, if I don't know, Letita, breakfast is a big, a big deal for me, just ask my husband and my kids. Um, I always, you know, breakfast, all sweets love breakfast, so... Um, I would say, first of all, it's important to eat the right things. Keep in mind, whatever you put in your system is what you get out. So you gotta just, you know, kind of find a happy medium. I'm all about balance. I'm not extreme one way or the other. I think it's important to be more consistent. Uh, but like Catherine said, you wanna make sure you get your protein. Um, I was, you know, I love carbs. Um, I don't know if carbs love me now, but early on, I mean, I love a lot of pasta, a lot of bread, rice, potatoes, and then, you know, throw in a little, um, salmon, Swedish salmon, <laughs> um, but also vegetables. But I think just, you know, um, a, um, a balanced diet is really important. I think it's important to eat, you know, proper meals and then on the golf course have a snack that keeps your, you know, your um, blood, sh uh, blood sugar level consistent. So, you know, have a little sport drink, you know, have a little peanut butter or something or some nuts or shakes or bar on the golf course to kind of keep it consistent. But just keep in mind, whatever you put in, you get out. So once in a while, it's okay to splurge, I think, but it's like anything in life. You know, you, you get what you put in. Yeah, I agree with that. Even because I played a tournament last year, it was like a super human week, and I had a Powerade, and like I noticed like immediately my, um, like I was getting like birdie bogey birdie, like it was just crazy. And then I cut that out, just started like drinking just water with no sugar, and then I noticed a huge difference in terms of my mood. So I, I do totally agree. Like what you eat on the course could be like really critical to keeping your blood sugar just stable and getting that like calm mentality that you want to have. That was a good question. Anything else? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Scarlett. Um, what goes into you like picking a caddy before events? It might be kind of a weird question, but what like characteristics were you looking for specifically, um, either for your game or just in general? And like, what kind of attitude did you feel fit you the best in terms of another person for your own course? Do you want me to start? Yeah, um, start. Sure. Well, first of all, I mean, a, a caddy is, is part of the team. Right? Um, so you want to make sure you have a good person that fits, you know, working with you and works with you and, and understands you and try to help you. Um, you know, I was lucky through my, my career, I only had two official caddies. Um, one was for uh, seven years and one was for nine years. So Colin Ken, he's actually still out there, believe it or not. Uh, Colin has worked for a lot of players. Um, Paula Kramer after me, and just recently Celine Boudier, and then and now I believe he works for Georgia Hall. Um, he's from England. Uh, I met him there my first year when I uh, played on the Ladies European Tour. Um, I think he was a rookie caddy, so we were two rookies, so that was a nice combo. Um, we kind of learned the way together. Uh, I think the key there was, you know, it's communication, um, you know, talking through shots or just understanding my game and I think, you know, it's easy to, you know, caddy for somebody who plays well, you just say good shot, right? It's harder to caddy for somebody who's not playing well, what do you say, when to say it, how do you build them up and, you know, do you, you know, how involved do you get with your player? I think that's something that you work out together, you know, practice rounds and I mean, it takes a little while to find somebody. Um, if you have a caddy, it's different if you have a caddy just weekly or here and there, then maybe you can't be so picky. Um, and many of you have your parents or your coaches on the bag. I have a lot of stories there. Um, it's a little different. <laughs> I always say you, uh, you get what you pay for, right? <laughs> so, um, I mean, I, I remember, you know, my dad has been in my bag. Uh, my mom has been in my bag. Um, uh, my coach has been in my bag. And I remember one tournament, um, 
they put some rocks in my dad's bag, and he's like, this bag is really heavy, and they were kidding with him, they put the rocks in the bottom of the bag, so. Um, but, you know, it's fun to have close ones with you, but a lot of times that can also be hard to, you know, if you want to make a decision, is it five or six, and you don't want to hurt their feeling, and then you hit with club, and it's not the right club, and it's like, how do you handle that? So, you know, have a communication open, maybe you decide, I pick the club, and, you know, you show up, and you look pretty, and you carry my bag, and we will have a good time. So, just kind of figure out the roles, I think that's easier. Um, I do remember a story with my dad on the bag. We come, this is a junior golf event. I'm probably, you know, at your age. And it was the ninth hole at this, this event, and it was a par five, and, and it was an elevated green, and I laid up after two shots, and I was debating to hit, you know, a club. And, you know, again, communication. So certain clubs, especially when it comes to wedges, my dad had a different terminology. So, you know, for, for me, you know, a wedge is a pitching wedge. And, and for him, it was a different thing. It was like a sandwich. And so when I said, let's hit a wedge, he's like thinking sandwich, and I'm thinking pitching wedge. So yeah, so I hit wedge, and this thing is airmailing the green. I'm flying over the flag, over the green, into the snack shop. And I looked at him, and I'm like, he says, yeah, you said wedge. And I said, yeah, this is pitching wedge. He goes, oh, I meant sandwich. I was like, okay. Anyway, so I go up there, and then I chip, and look at me par, and we go back, we go past the snack shop, and my dad goes, would you like to have a sandwich? I said the timing wasn't the best there, so no sandwich for me. But, um, so anyway, we all have those stories, and, um, probably have more, more stories like that, but keep in mind that they're a teammate of yours. Um, my second caddy, Terry McNamara, uh, we worked together for nine years. He uh, kind of was the last caddy I had, and then I retired. Um, it was funny, the story with him is I had, you know, Colin and I, had, we worked together. It was working very well, but eventually I felt like we were not communicating, and we took things for granted, and he thought I was thinking like that. And, but I wasn't thinking like that, and then so a lot of mental errors on the golf course. And I told Terry, I mean, sorry, Colin, we've had a good, you know, good success together. I said I just need a break. I just feel like we're just taking each other for granted. So I didn't really know where to go or find another caddy. You just, I mean, you don't go and just steal somebody from somebody else. You know, you have to be a little smart about it and you know, kind of ask around a little bit. But um, there was two caddies that I was thinking I would love to have them help me. So I did a little, uh, a little test. I said, this other guy's um, Jason. I said, Jason, you can try these two events, and then Terry, you will try these two events. So Jason goes with me, and we go to St. Louis. Um, I play very well. I win the tournament. So that was a good start. Um, then we go to the British Open, and Jason and I, we finish second. So not too bad, first and second. Then I get, uh, I, but I promised Terry to get a chance, and so I said, Jason, I'm just going to try Terry. So we, we head to Minnesota for the World Championship, and I'm having my worst day ever as a professional. I believe I birdied the last hole to break 80. So I shoot 79, and I'm thinking, oh, whoa. And then I guess Terry he went home to his hotel room, and he called his wife, and he said, and she said, how did it go? He said, ah. Didn't go so well. She shot the highest she's ever done <laughs> on the, you know, on the LPGA tour. But um, long story short, I ended up hiring Terry after that tournament because I knew that he was the guy. Because again, it's easy to caddy for somebody who plays well. It's hard to caddy for somebody who's not. So and I felt like Terry could help me through tough times. And you know, if I, I'm sure if I would have somebody else, I might have shot 85. So that's something to think about. You know, how can a caddy help you? Um, and therefore, after that, Terry and I worked together for nine years. So there you have it. Long story, or many stories, but um, that's kind of how I look at caddies. Think of them as you know, as your 15th club. Very nice. Um, <laughs> I definitely have a different approach when it comes to caddies, just given because I just turned pro last year. Um, but I could I could elaborate a little bit on college coaches as caddies. Um, so usually when there's a tournament, it's either the head coach or the assistant coach is going to walk with you, and they're kind of going to be like chatting with you or just having a good time, like figuring out distances. Um, like from my view, just kind of as a um, high schooler going into college. Um, 
I would definitely advise you guys if like if you would like to have um, one of the head coaches or assistant coaches caddy for you let them know ahead of time like hey um, can you come and watch me like watch me on the first three holes because I might be a little bit nervous like I, I need someone here or um, like to be very straight up with them like Annika said about communication um, and like let's say one of your head coaches is with you and they give you a distance on a par three for your um, shot into the green and then like the player doesn't agree with the coach but it's kind of like you know, the player is going to be hitting the shot so at least for me it was like hey hey Mike like I, I don't think like this is the right play like can we step back and talk about it like for a couple seconds like just that in itself for me like really improved the commitment instead of like hitting the shot you didn't really feel comfortable with and then just kind of not being in a bad mood like oh I did what the coach said and I feel like I could have done this like taking that extra 10-15 seconds even like if you're not on the clock can really save you strokes and just, just really like start over, talk over the shot, and then go from there. Because like there's been situations, at least with me and like the coaches that have coached for me, where I was like, ah, oh, it was his fault, or like I could have done this. And just by kind of being there at the moment, saying like, hey, like I don't, I'm not sure about this, and then starting over, doing it again. Like I guarantee you, you'll hit a better shot, and like you guys will have a much better time, like, player and coach. Um, in terms of, like, caddies overall, um, since you guys are still junior golfers, I'm sure you've had caddies um, other than your parents. I think now would be a good time to just um, experiment. Um, maybe you've had a really good caddy at a USGA tournament. Um, make sure to keep that relationship because who knows, maybe they'll be your caddy when you guys turn pro. Um, I think now is a good time to figure out like what kind of caddy you're looking for and like maybe you like a talkative caddy or maybe you like caddies who just don't really talk and give you numbers. Um, yeah, just experiment around with it um, unless you guys are going to be turning pro the next year. There's not really a rush to be like, this is the exact person I want on my back. Yeah. I think those are very good, uh, good comments uh, because at the end of the day, it's all about you playing golf and playing your golf. And I know for a fact that many ladies um, on the LPJ, I mean, they they get this caddy on the bag and and they're afraid to say something. And so now they walk around and they kind of walk on eggshells, or I should have said that and I didn't, and then it bugs them three holes later. So, you know, it could feel a little tough, you know, when you feel like you have to be the boss. And at the end of the day, it's your decision, so you gotta, you know, whatever club you pick, if you gotta feel comfortable with that. It's not about, you know, I gotta please this, you know, him or her for that reason. So really feel um, that you need to have somebody that fits you and and not the, the other way around. So. That was a long answer, are you happy with that? <laughs> you got the blanket, that looks cozy. Um, what else do we have? Yeah. How do you recover mentally after a tough hole? I can go first. Um, I feel like I've definitely been there from winning tournaments to having the yips, like you name it. I've been there, I've been playing for over 10 years, so I'm not, not to get you, but uh, just my story is that in terms of if you have a bad hole, um, I would say just immediately after you're done with that hole, kind of just look it over, like, hey, did I hit my driver in the woods? Like, what, what, did, what, what went wrong? Did I let my emotions take over? Did I chunk a shot and get mad? And then did I let that affect the next shot? I would say kind of um, just, just briefly analyze it in your brain. Like, what, what do you think I could have done better? Maybe it wasn't the tee shot. And then just kind of just have an overview. Um, and then from there, you have to have the self-talk of like, Hey, just because I made a double or just because I made a triple, like that's that's not that's not me. Like if you play the statistics in a round, given how good you guys are, like the 
statistics of you making a double like is is just not there like compared to how many birdies and pars or eagles you guys are making so um, stick stick to the percentages know that because you guys are already playing in this tournament you guys are good golfers like you can't let a missed four foot putt like affect you and then you're kind of just getting nervous on the next tee box like that happens to everyone. Just even look on TV with like the best players in the world. Like they're going to be hitting some like not good shots either. So you can't really take it to heart, especially if you happen to make a bad hole. It's just it's just golf. Yeah, I would um, echo that. I think you know that's probably one of the hardest things in golf is you know to move on from a bad shot or a bad hole, and especially if you feel like you know that's something that I can do. You know that I can do well. That it's un, you know unlike you to hit a shot like that or a putt uh, that you're not happy with. But you know, like Captain said, it happens to everybody. I think the best advice is if you can be the quickest to forget about that shot or, or that hole. Is probably the best thing you can do is just to move on. I mean, that's why we play 18 holes. So if it's happened on the first, just think you know, have 17 more holes to to do better. And if it's towards the end, it's like okay, I just want to finish on a higher note. So you know. What I would love to do is just take a quick reaction on the course, a quick you know assessment, and then try to, to move on. And when the round is over, that's when you you know look at your scorecard and maybe you make some notes on on that little slip that you tear off, and and that's when you go work on things. You know, was it a you know a technical issue? Was it a mental issue? What was it? And then you work on it. I mean, you're not going to go a single round with any mistakes. I mean, I wish I could say that you know it's not, but it, it's. You're gonna have mistakes, and and you know it's not in this room. And whoever wins this week, it's not necessarily who hit the best shots. It's the one that hit you know the least amount of bad shots. And so we are gonna hit bad shots, and just try to try to forget them. You know, learn from them and move on. You know, life is is not a straight journey by any means, and neither will your golf be. It's gonna turn to the left. It's gonna turn to the to the right. It's gonna go up, and you're gonna have your, your downs. And it's just. The quicker you can recover from them, the better, and um, and that's what makes these t days like today and makes you stronger, right? You know, just throw bad shots out and move forward. Think about the good ones. When you stand over the ball, you need to have a positive vision, trust yourself, and and just you know see that best seven iron you ever hit. And and I think that's the hardest lesson, the mental aspect of the game is how do you stand over a shot when you know maybe the previous hole wasn't so good so try to move on you know and that's just the best lesson i can tell you we had one in, right yeah. um during the peak of your career what was your practice schedule like i practiced a lot <laughs> <laughs> i mean that was kind of my golf was you know my life in that sense i mean it was I divide my season into three seasons. It was tournament season, practice season, and rest season. Um, they were not all the same length. Obviously, tournament season is longer. Um, practice season was, you know, maybe a few weeks, and then rest season was maybe very similar. Um, but you know, I would say that you know you pr start in the morning. It's you know, go in the gym, have some some kind of practice, and then have a good breakfast, and just head to the golf course, practice, whether I'm hitting balls or whether I'm chipping, have some lunch and maybe play or continue to practice. And then, you know, after that it was maybe a massage or stretch and, or just get a lot of rest. I mean, you know, when you get to a certain level, and many of you are already there, but I mean, it's, you know, how serious are you with your golf game? You know, how disciplined are you? And how driven are you? And what do you want with your golf? And, you know, there's no, you know, there's no cap. There's no... You know, ceiling. I mean, you can be as good as you want. You can work as hard as you like. Um, I think what holds us back is, you know, maybe we're not, you know, as focused, or maybe we don't have clear goals, or our journey is not necessarily, um, you know, we can't really see it. So, you know, it's. I just feel like practice is is what got me ready. Um, you know, whether it's. I mean, you know, you feel like you can always practice. If it's not your driver, it's your three wood. If it's not the three wood, it's the hybrid. If it's not that, it's a seven iron. And then it's a pitching wedge, and then it's chipping. I mean, there's so many, there are endless shots to work on. Um, and I, I took that as a challenge, rather than saying, oh, then you get tired of it. It's just, you know, there's a lot of fun shots to practice, and keep in mind to practice the things that you're, 
you know, maybe not so good at your weaknesses. Spend a lot of time with your weaknesses. Don't just hit shots, the shots that you love. You know, don't just spend, get stronger on your strongest part. Um, I did that, and it, it's fun when you get really good at something, but then you have other parts of the game that's holding you down. So really make sure that your weakest part is, you know, up, up to par. So. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong how much you should practice. You would know. I mean, listen to your body. You know, when it's tournament season, I wouldn't grind so much. I wouldn't work on my technique so much. I wouldn't change a lot of my swing because it's competition. It's, it's um, scoring mode. It's, it's, not, it's not how it looks. It's how it ends up. And I think a lot of people get caught up, oh, that wasn't a good swing. Well, you're two feet from the hole. I would take that any day. You know, focus more on, on the results. And then when it's practice season, that's when you practice. That's it's not about scoring. It's about practicing, working on your grip or your turn or whatever impact or whatever you're working on. That's practicing, uh, and then rest. I, I know many um, young ladies your age. It's like, well, I want to be the best, and I got to practice every day. No, you don't need to practice every day. You need to have some rest once in a while. Your body needs to recoup. If you're pushing yourself. You know, hard every single day. It's kind of like your cell phone. You know, when that battery is low, if you keep pushing that button, it's not going to happen. You need to charge it. You need to turn it off and get some rest. And then it's 100%. And then you can push thousand buttons if you want. And that's the same thing with the body. I mean, you need to charge. You need to sleep. It's really important. You need to eat the right things. And it's just, you know, think of your body and your golf game as, as puzzle pieces. There's a lot of pieces, you know. Um, but in the end of the day, all the pieces need to fit, and they need to be the right pieces. So, um, but what pieces is kind of up to you, and you will learn what you need to spend time on, and the things that you do not need to spend time on. And, and that I think is the beauty, because a lot of things that I've done, I've learned from other players and coaches, and, and I picked a lot here, and I picked a lot here, that I thought worked for me. But at the end of the day, you have to kind of find your recipe, your recipe for success, and it's not always the same. And I think that's the beauty of it, because we're not the same. We're all very different. We come from different places. Um, we have different cultures. Um, we're tall, we're a little shorter, um, we're younger, we're older, whatever it is. You've got to find yours and just get better. And I think the things that you would learn is like, well, what am I going to do? How do I know what's right for me? Well, you will find out what's right for you. If it works, most likely it's working, right? It's the right thing. If it's not working, then you know, figure out what am I doing wrong? Am I doing too much? Or am I doing too little? Maybe I should do that. And, and that's why it's, this is a journey, right? This is a journey. Um, and, you know, you start young and you keep going and, and it it's never really ends. You just kind of get better in different areas and, and you experience things along the way. And that's what Catherine said, enjoy every day because it's, if you're working on something, it's not going to happen overnight. So take the little successes, and be thankful for them, and then you work on on the areas that needs a little touch up. But you can still score if it's not perfect. I don't want you to feel like you gotta wake up in the morning and, and like I said, every piece has to fit. <laughs> you know, it doesn't always fit right, but you can still get it around. You can still do good, but it can, you know, it gets better when some of the pieces fit a little better. Yeah, that was a good answer. Like. Um, golf is not a game of perfect. I don't know if you guys have heard of that book by Bob Rotella. Like, you definitely, no one is perfect, Miley Cyrus, um, Hannah Montana, but, like, you can't expect to have your perfect game, like, you can't have everything going, like, all four aspects of golf be, like, the way exactly how you want it. It's, I think golf is mainly a game of managing with what you have, um, in terms of practicing, I would, I look at golf as, or anything you're interested in doing, even school or um, hobbies, like a vertical comparison, like you versus you. Like if someone else is practicing a whole bunch on one aspect of their game, and you know for a fact that that doesn't work for you, like it doesn't mean that you should be doing what they're doing. Like, at the end of the day, you guys have had the good performances and you've known what works for you. Um, like, for me, it's all about highlighting on the strengths of your game and just fine-tuning your weaknesses. Um, and kind of, like, just knowing that, just 
being able to practice with the time that you have. I know that some of you guys might be in school right now. It's just tough to like find a, like you, it's not like me right now where I'm a pro golfer and I have the whole day. It's very much about managing your time nicely. And just given the time that you have and the energy you have that day, putting it, putting in your best effort like every single day. Um, it's kind of like the book, The Atomic Habits kind of um, improving 1% every day. If, if you're going through a swing change or a technique and you're chipping or putting, just keep working on it every single day. And even though you may not see progress in something, over time, it could be a series of three months, six months even, you'll, you'll eventually see the results come in. But you'll definitely not see them like the day after you're done with the practice session. Good stuff, yeah? Anything else? Yeah, we have a few. There and here. Right here. here. No, there. <laughs> Catherine, how did you uh, balance your schoolwork with playing Division One golf? Yeah, that, that for me was a bit of a tough one because I'm kind of the type to like procrastinate. I don't know if there's any procrastinators in the room right now. Um, like, I think for me, being aware of my tendencies, like I know I like to wait until the last minute to do stuff. So if I ever had a tournament that I know I'm gonna be out for five days, and then I need to be catching up on school to prep for a midterm, then I knew that I had to take the weekend maybe before off, and then I couldn't, do some of the fun things that some of my other friends at school were doing because I knew that I had to get this schoolwork done and get the practice that I needed for the tournament. Um, it was pretty much managing your time in college is very much about sacrificing. At the end of the day, you know like what's important to you. If it's golf, then you have to like kind of eliminate a good amount of um, social activities, as sad as it sounds, because your schedule is going to just be overwhelming um, because at least at yeah, USC Southern Cal practice started at 6.45 every day and it ended at 11. So I was constantly waking up at 5.30 a.m. and that just takes a toll on your body, especially having four hours of practice and then maybe a lunch break, classes, and at the end of the day you're just tired. And to, to really like play well and do well at school, it's a big sacrifice. I think you may come to the point where it's like my golf is more important than my school and then you may have to have like more golf time dedicated or if you're more academically driven you may have to cut out some of your golf practicing. It's just very much like what you want and like it's you putting in the work in terms of what you want to like be good at and to succeed in division one that's yeah. Just to add a little bit to that, I, I think you covered yeah, it. Sorry to scare you, but it's no, that's but like it's the reality so, of college yeah. and golfing. It's, I think it's important to, you know, you don't need to sugarcoat it. I think it is what it is. And I remember my mom told me one time, uh, because that time management that you mentioned and what's important to you and goal setting, my mom said to me one time, because I felt like I was just running around, I really didn't get anything done, and she said, Annika, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. So, you know, maybe there's a time in your life when that's more important than other things, so prioritize. Um, so, just keep that in mind. Do we have time for one more? And then, we have a few more. All right. Hi. Um, do you change your strategy based on weather conditions? So, if it's rainy or windy or cold? You mean as far as just how to play a golf course? Yeah. Um, I do think conditions, um, you know, they matter, definitely, I mean, uh, if it rains overnight, we all know that the course is going to be playing longer, you know, maybe the greens won't be as fast, and then if it's windy, you know, certain holes will feel more narrow than others, so I would say yes, you know, you, you, know, you have a practice round, and, and maybe it's sunny and no wind, then you get a feel for the course, and then the next day is, you know, this hurricane blowing, so I think that's what, one of the things I like about the game is you need to be able to pivot, you need to be able to adjust. 
Uh, I mean, it can happen just on the back nine. So, but I think that's again, you know, being prepared for what's out there. And I mean, I always have the right things in the golf bags. So you don't don't be surprised if it rains, and then you have no rain suit, for example. Or just be ready. And the same thing in golf. I mean, if it's really windy, maybe you need to start hitting the ball a little lower. So just to the golf course, um, because it's going to be different depending on what conditions you will find. Yeah, I agree. Um, like one of my favorite lines is like in life in general, the only constant variable in life is change. So it's kind of like it could be this week, like it could be raining and then sunny and then windy. It's kind of just having that mentality to be able to adapt. I feel like just by saying like, oh, I could hit in the wind. I could I could play on fast greens. I could play on slow greens. I could. Like being able to have that self-talk and know that you're like capable of hitting well in certain conditions can really give you a big advantage compared to like a competitor who's like, oh, it's raining. Like, I don't want to be here today. Like, just being able to be up for it and being grateful that you're here. Like at this wonderful tournament playing golf, like in Florida right now. Um, yeah, that's definitely something to keep in mind. But in terms of course management, um, when it's raining, yeah, definitely your ball won't be running out as much. So there might be a couple um, club choice changes you might have to make. Maybe the greens might slow down a little bit. So that means like maybe hitting your putts a bit harder, maybe playing less break. It's just kind of like adapting to what comes to you. Just a, a quick little story on that I remember. I know you girls are a lot better than I am at when I was at your age, but I remember we were playing in Scotland. Uh, True uh, Golf Club was the name of the club, and our practice round, it was you know sunny, and it was 70 degrees. It was a beautiful day, and, and at that time, this was the beginning of my amateur career, so I made a lot of notes, but and I look at them, you know, later in life, and I was wondering really what I was thinking when I wrote these notes, because on the first hole, I, I wrote down driver uh, nine iron, so, and I thought that that was very helpful, but I didn't write any yardages down. I mean, who knows how far you hit your nine iron, maybe at that time. Uh, so the next day, the tournament starts, and it's so cold, so windy, and I'm looking at my notes, and I'm like, there's no way I can hit driver nine iron. As a matter of fact, I hit driver three wood nine iron to get to the green. So um, I found this yardage book, you know, years later, and I realized that maybe you should put the yardage down, like 135 or whatever, so that you have some kind of reference. So those are things that you learn along the way, and just you know, it's it's a lesson for everybody all the time. But um, yeah, I mean, I would even adjust my strategy if I wasn't feeling great. You know, some days when you know I have a warm up and I'm just striping it, it's like. Well, maybe today I can be a little more aggressive. I can go for the flex. I can go, you know, for the tuck pin. And there are just some days you warm up and it's just not, it's not there, right? It's just, you try. And so I go on the golf course and I'd be like, okay, well, the flag is tucked left. I think I'm going just for the center of the green. So, you know, the weather is not the only factor out there that would make me change my strategy, just how I feel. Uh, because those days when you don't hit it exactly where you want it, it's like, okay, this, can I just, you know, save this round and then maybe start over tomorrow? So. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely about playing with what you have, and some days are better than others. And just be aware that you may have to change some play calls, and that's not the end of the world. You've probably done it before, and you can you can do it again. Um, what is your favorite putting drill? to do if you're you know not feeling too confident on um, your putting what's your favorite drill to get you back in the dial back in the dial do you wanna yeah um, I'm very much on like I like to repeat things at work so I I have this um, putting mirror so when I practice I always make sure my fundamentals are down like if something, like I notice something's off, like I look at the mirror, like are my eyes aligned with the mirror, am I aim right, how's my grip, how's the tempo of my stroke, um, so that's probably like a must, like checking if my shoulders are neutral, and then from there I'll go into maybe a speed drill, um, if I'm struggling in speed, like I might put an alignment stick um, two feet past the pin, um, and I try to, it depends, it can be from 
20 feet, 30 feet, grasping the speed of the greens. But at least for me, I can't really like partake in a good practice drill without getting my mechanics down. Because the last thing you want is practicing putting with like a bad stroke or your shoulders are open and then kind of messing it up. So I would suggest like getting your mechanics down and then doing like a drill. I would say very similar. I think it depends on what, what I'm working on. If it's the speed, then I would have, um, kind of like you said, Catherine, you need to put a, you know, something behind the hole, make sure you end there, or just putt from different holes. And uh, But I think a lot of times, if, you know, if you feel like you're not putting well, is, you know, create more of a tournament situation. So have one ball and, and, and putt, and so you really kind of go through your routine, you know, read it. You know, always have an intention, always have a purpose of the putt. Um, I spend a lot of time on the shorter putts because I feel like I need to work on those. And I would have, you know, put tees around, kind of like we call it around the world or whatever, around the clock and just putt one and then, you know, hit a putt or make the putt, I should say, and then go to the next one and go through my routine. So I really kind of get into that. Uh, it's so easy for me, especially just to kind of stand there and and hit putt after putt to not really have an intention. And uh, a lot of times I make those, and then when it means something, it's like, whoa, okay, I'm, I'm gonna focus here. So the more you can create the tournament situations, I think it's better, uh, because that's really what you're practicing for. You know, when you're in a tournament, you don't like toss down three balls here on number nine, and then, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna take the one I want. Um, so you just kind of create the situations you feel like you, you know, you feel like you need to improve on. Yeah, um, if you look at golf statistically and putting, um, those short putts from 10 feet in are pretty much, they account for almost like half of all your putts. So I definitely agree, doing, like practicing with a purpose, lining up your ball, like pretending it's a tournament, maybe it could be like making 104 foot putts in a row or um, doing around the world stuff, getting that three, four, five, six foot range down, but. Yeah, definitely. I can't emphasize enough how important those like short putts are um, in terms of how they contribute to your score. So, all right. Thank you, Ozzy Taylor, over here. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for listening and for coming tonight. As you know, uh, part of the Olympic Foundation, we do more than golf, so we like to do things a little differently than just focus on the tournaments. And uh, this is one of the sessions, so. Thank you for being patient and staying here. I know many of you are cold and tired, but uh, hopefully you pick out a point or two. And thank you, Catherine, for for all your um, wise words and being here and sharing your story. And we yeah, want to well, wish you good luck. Too much. Like, just pretty much enjoy it.